Hey guys, welcome to VLTV. Our guest tonight has a master's degree in business administration and founded a cybersecurity business along with her husband in 2010. She also works part-time as a coordinator of the moms group at her church. As a business and communication specialist, her goals were to start a business and become financially independent to raise her family the best she could. Things drastically changed the summer of 2015, shortly after the birth of her second child. After four years of fighting for justice, she has now become a public speaker and a writer. Her focus is on educating citizens while being a voice for those who have been victimized by the unconstitutional vices of family courts and child protective services. Help us welcome to the show, Rachel Bruno. Thank you. <laughs> Glad to be here. <laughs> Rachel, thank you so much for taking the time to share your story with us. This is an incredible story. The first time I heard one of your other interviews, I was in tears. Um, so thank you for sharing it with our viewers. Thank you for giving me the opportunity. So I tell us that. what happened with the birth of your second child. Well, just a little background. You know, as you said, I'd started my business with my husband and I had a second child. I mean, I had my first son by then and I'm an only child. So I knew right off the bat that I wanted to have more than one. So life is a little crazy raising newborns and I have a medical condition. I have epilepsy and one of the main triggers to the seizures is lack of sleep or uninterrupted or interrupted sleep. So first time around, the grandmas helped me. And second time around, they're like, we're too old for this. <laughs> so my mother-in-law actually gave me the money to go find a nanny. And I'm like, I love you. You are the best mother-in-law ever. <laughs> right. So I went about looking for a nanny to take care of the baby at night so that I could at least sleep and my husband could, you know, carry on with the business. So we found this nanny through uh, an agency. And the agency wasn't able to do the months that I needed. So I asked the doula from the agency if she knew somebody privately, you know, who would be willing to do this. And she recommended this person. And this person was working at the church, volunteered at the nursery. She had a bachelor's degree in biological sciences. She had two children herself. Her husband was stationed in the Marines. So, I mean, there was really no red flags, you know, as far as we were concerned. We did the background check. We got everything checked out. And she started watching my son when he was seven days old. Wow. From 10 p.m. until 6 a.m. That was her shift. So basically all night. And when he was seven weeks old, I woke up to him screaming at about four o'clock in the morning. And there's a reason why she watched him at night, right? Right. So that I could sleep. Right. I, it, uninter uh, interrupted sleep. That triggers your epilepsy. Yes. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So I would pump all day <laughs> and yeah. she would nurse him at night. So at 4 a.m. I woke up that morning and my husband was actually on a business trip out of town. So I was by myself with my 20 month old son at the time and the seven week old son at the time. And I heard him screaming and then he stopped. Then I looked at the clock like 4.06. I remember at 4.06. And I said, okay, either changing the diaper, feeding him, doing something of the sort. He stopped crying, so I tried to go back to sleep. And this went on for probably about half an hour, crying, stopping, crying, stopping. Then, you know, I finally got up. I'm like, what the heck is going on? So I went to the bedroom. She had the door, like, partially opened. And I was standing in the hallway, and I just stood at the, the door. And she was looking down on the crib, had him swaddled, and was kind of like, rocking him back and forth. And he was just screaming, I mean, screaming. Like I'd never heard that kind of screaming before. And she didn't look at me. She didn't, I don't know if she even noticed I was standing there until he was really screaming. Then she picked him up and put him like on a burp position. And then she like swung around and she saw me standing right there. And I'm like, what happened? She's like, I just fed him four o'clock, which was normal. That's usually the time he would eat. And I think he's really gassy. I'm like, okay, you know, fair enough. Babies get gassy. And, you know, she was like this and shushing him. And this, he stopped screaming, but he was obviously really uncomfortable. 
And by that time, five o'clock in the morning, her shift would be over by six. So I'm like, he's obviously not settling down. So I'm awake already. So, you know, just give him to me. And I definitely didn't want to wake up my 20 month old who was across the, the hall. Right. So I took the baby. She went home. She's like, okay, you sure? I'm like, yeah, sure. So she went home, went to my room, unswaddled him, gave him skin to skin. And he did stop crying. He stopped crying. And I'm like, okay, you just wanted your mommy. Right. And the skin to skin connection. And I dozed off. I must have dozed off for a couple of hours. And again, woke up to him screaming at about seven. So it was about two hours, right, of him not saying anything or not crying, not mentioning anything. And I woke up and I'm like, okay, seven o'clock, your last feeding was at four. So you're hungry. So I tried to nurse him and he would not latch on whatsoever. And he would open his mouth and, you know, his eyes wouldn't open his eyes. And I'm still thinking gassy, right? Yeah. Colicky, gassy baby, not wanting to eat. Yeah. So I swaddled him again. And at that point, my 20 month old wakes up. So I'm home alone and I'm here. Okay, let me go get your brother. And again, I'm swaddled and I'm holding him like this. He's fine. Then I put him down in the crib, screams like crazy, starts screaming, screaming, screaming. I'm like, okay, I run back. I pick him up. He stops crying. So I'm like, okay, you just want to be held. So I'm holding him. I go into my son's room. I pick him up with my other arm, <laughs> you know, <laughs> plop him on the changing table and change his diaper, do our regular morning routine, give him his bottle. Thankfully, you know, almost two years old, he was a little bit more independent at that point. So he was fine. And this baby just, I could not put him down. Anytime I put him down, he was screaming. So I start Googling, Dr. Google. Uh -huh. <laughs> screaming baby. <laughs> okay, nursing strike. Uh, colic, gassiness, you know, all of the above, basically. <laughs> right. Yeah. And it would have never, ever crossed my mind what was actually going on with him. So, you know, long story short, uh, missed the feeding at 10 a.m. again. He would not eat again. So I'm like, okay, this is really weird. A newborn missing two feedings yeah. and just screaming, you know. So I called my, my pediatrician. I'm like, he's been screaming since 4 o'clock in the morning. I don't know what's wrong with him. And the receptionist said, well, doctor doesn't have an appointment until 3.15 in that afternoon. And I'm like, no, he's been screaming since 4 o'clock. I need to see somebody. And she's like, well, take him to the ER then. So I'm like, okay, take him to the ER. And another, you know, inconvenience, my mom was with her husband who was having cataract surgery that day. So my mom was unavailable. My husband was out of state. And here I am with these two screaming babies. <laughs> But I texted my mom. I'm like, mom, please, you know, can you find someone else to pick up my dad and you come to the hospital with me? Because this kid, there's something wrong with him. I don't know what's wrong with him. So she agreed. She comes to my house and I hand him to her. I'm like, what? I, I don't know what's wrong. So she takes off his diaper. She takes off everything. She's looking at him for rashes, right. fevers, yeah. anything we can find. And there was nothing, absolutely nothing. And she looked at him. She's like, Rachel, I don't know what's wrong with him, but he's obviously in a lot of pain. I'm like, yeah, okay. So get the two kids in the car. And as we're driving to the hospital, you know, kids usually fall asleep in their car seat. Yeah. And he did. Oh, good. But I thought, I'm like, okay, now the doctors are going to think I'm crazy, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that I'm this overreacting mother <laughs> with the newborn taking him to the emergency room. So when I got the emergency room, he was not crying anymore. He was just laying there on my shoulder. And I tell the, the person, right, he hasn't, eaten in what seven hours and he was screaming and now he he stopped I, I don't know what's wrong with him but something's wrong with him so you know make me fill out all the forms fine go to the waiting room nurse takes all the the vitals everything was fine and then they immediately though they put me in the the room and a pediatrician asked me how old he was what were the symptoms then asked me to lay him down on the bed oh. and I did and then the doctor walks away and I'm like okay thinking you know he's probably going to give me a drill or something and tell me to go home <laughs> yeah. but he stopped at the door and was just observing from a distance just looking at the baby from a distance and just silence and I'm like okay this is weird yeah all right I'm looking at the baby I'm looking at him he's looking at the baby and then about five seconds later he walks back to the the bed and his hand goes straight to his ear behind his left ear he's like did you feel this I said no so he grabs my hand, puts it there. It's like, you feel that bulge? 
Mm. Yeah, now I do. Yeah. yeah. And he's like, that's fluid that's leaking from his brain. Oh my gosh. And I'm, I'm like, okay. And I bet your heart was like, just. Yeah, I'm in shock. shock. I'm like, what? Okay, yeah. what does that mean? Right? Right, right. <laughs> and he's like, it could be blood or it could be spinal cerebral fluid. So we have to go do a CT scan right now. So he puts me on the bed, you know, closes the rails. I'm holding the baby. And they're just running down the hospital hallway. Oh yeah. And all the nurses pushing the bed. And out of, they, out of nowhere, they start bolting, like, really fast. And I look down at him, and his right arm was twitching. Oh, yeah. no. So that's when I sort of, light bulb went off in my head. Left side of the brain, right arm twitching. He's having a seizure. Oh, no. Right? Yeah. But immediately I felt like, oh, God, I gave this to my son. I passed this on to my son. Right. right. And I'm asked the nurse, I'm like, is this normal? And she's like, no. And they're running. And I'm praying right then and there. I'm like, God, you know, please spare my son from having to live with this like I did mm-hmm. for my whole life. You know, have mercy on my son. And that was just enough to get to the CT room. And the doctors, you know, placed him on there, made me stand over there put on what looks like a bulletproof vest, right? As you're standing mm-hmm. there. Mm-hmm. And they did the CT scan and they're like, okay, you can go wait at the room and we'll call you when we have the results. So my mom is with me. My 20 month old son is bouncing off the walls, right? Hadn't taken his nap yet. And I'm just praying. I'm texting my husband who's out of state. I'm texting my family in Brazil. That's where I'm originally from, is from Brazil. And everybody, I'm like, I don't know what is going on, but pray. So a few minutes later, the doctor is Mrs. Bruno. I said, yes, come here. And he looks at me. He's like, this is very serious. And I'm like, okay. And he pulls me over to the computer where all the images are. And he showed me the image. He's like, you see this, the bone? I'm like, yeah. Like, this is the cranial fracture. <gasps> and an intracerebral blood hemorrhage. It was blood. Oh, my God. And he says, the brain hates blood okay there is no blood in the brain and in, when the brain comes into contact with blood it doesn't like Pours it so out. Like, mm-hmm. we're gonna have to go emergency surgery right now to try to drain the blood and fix the fracture and i'm still in shock i'm still like what what processing like, it occurred to me like fracture for me i'm thinking a newborn that their head isn't completely formed yet mm-hmm. right so you know the fontelles the different mm-hmm. flaps that you have i'm like did one of those things just pop open and then blood, an aneurysm. I'm like, I had no idea what to think, right? So I signed all the papers. They're like, are you against blood transfusions? I'm like, no, whatever you have to do to save my son, you do it. So they take him into the ER. I go tell my mom. And again, we're texting, we're praying, and just waiting, right? Waiting for what's going to happen. And while I was in the waiting room, I call the nanny. Naively, I called the nanny. <laughs> Right. And I asked her, Mike, you remember all that fussiness this morning? And she's like, yeah, is he okay? And I'm like, I'm at the hospital and he's having brain surgery. I'm like, what happened? And she's still, nothing, nothing happened. The only thing I can picture maybe is that his head was really close to the rail on the crib. Like he tended to move around and I'm like, okay. No. Yeah. So I'm like, okay, now you're just lying to me. <laughs> Right. But I still didn't. I kept my cool. You know, I hung up with her. I told my mom, I'm like, fine. At that point, I had no idea what was going to happen. Right. What was what was coming. Yeah. So the surgeon comes back and he tells me, you know, your son is, is good. We drained all the blood. How long did that take? It was about four hours. Oh, my God. Oh wow. Yeah. And he said we drained all the blood. We were able to put a, what they call a sugar plate on the fracture which kind of dissolves mm-hmm. into the brain, I mean, into the scalp, you know, cause he's too young. Like he's still going to grow, right? His cranium is still going to grow. So most likely he will have to have a reconstructive surgery. Oh my gosh. Yeah, but for now we've done what we could yeah. and take me to the PICU, right? He's in the PICU and the doctor said he's in a medically induced coma right now because he started having seizures after the surgery because of the contact with the blood probably most likely. Yeah. And we don't know whether he's going to survive the next 48 hours. Oh my gosh. Yeah. So at that point, you know, here I am by myself. 
in that room. And I just pray again. You know, I said, God, please don't take him away from me. I have to dedicate the rest of my life to taking care of my son, whether it's brain damage, whatever it is, please don't take him away from me. And at that point, you know, if you're a born again Christian, you know about the Holy Spirit. And that voice came over me and said, he's mine. He's mine. I gave him to you. Nobody's going to take him away from you. And I just had peace at that moment. You know, the peace that surpasses all understanding. And I'm like, okay, God, you know, he's in your hands. He couldn't be in better hands than in God's hands. And, you know, thankfully the doctors are here taking care of him. And I was at peace at that point. You know, I can't explain it, yeah. but I was. And I called my mom to the PICU. You know, my son saw him. I asked my friend to come pick up my mom and take them home so, you know, that my older son could spend the night at my mom's house. I was obviously not leaving the hospital. My husband was on his way to LAX, which is the Los Angeles International Airport from his business trip, arriving that night. So I'm just waiting there. And about 8.30 or 9 p.m., so this happened at 4 a.m. I'd been up since 4 a.m. Right. Surgery started at about noon, ended at about four, and at about 8.30 or nine is when a man in uniform and a lady with a clipboard comes and knocks on the door to the hospital. And I don't know if you've ever been like in an intensive care unit, everything is glass, right? Yeah. So, you know, they knock on the glass door and I see a man in uniform and I'm like, okay, sure, you know, weird. Like, what is a police officer doing here? Right. And then he comes and talks to me. He's like, what happened to your son was worse than getting shot by a bullet. Wow. And I'm like, okay. And again, in my head, I'm like, it's pretty obvious who did this, right? right? Or what happened? And, you know, so I took it as him giving me a heads up. Like, you're obviously not going to employ this nanny anymore. <laughs> right. Right. So he's like, we're here to help you. And we want to figure out how this happened to your son can we talk to you? And I'm like, of course. So they come sit down on the bed, you know, the hospital beds, they talk to me. I tell them the story, everything since 4am that morning. And, you know, I still not suspecting anything. They kept asking me, what do you think happened? And I'm like, I don't know. I wasn't there, right? I was sleeping. I woke up to him screaming. That's all I know. I have no idea what happened. And okay, he kept quiet. And then he's like, why did you bring him to a hospital in Orange County when you live in LA County? So they're different counties, oh. but they're about, it's about a 20 minute drive from one county to the other. Right. And I'm like, because this is the children's hospital that I know. <laughs> wow. <laughs> and he's like, why did you wait so long to bring him to the hospital? And I'm like, because I didn't know what was going on. You know, she told me he was gassy. I had no idea. And he's like, okay, why didn't you call 911? I'm like, because he was a seven week old crying. You know, do you have newborns? They cry a lot. <laughs> and I can drive. And, right? yeah. and I'm like, and I didn't know. Again, I had no idea of the severity right. of his condition. And thank goodness you didn't wait for the 3.30 appointment with oh. your pediatrician <laughs> as well. Right. So he's just standing there at the door. And then the social worker asked me questions, you know, and of course they're very nice. They're very sweet. And she asked me and I tell her everything. And did you have any postpartum depression? And I'm like, no, I didn't because I didn't. Then right. later on, I will come to find out that that is something they, they generally will use against moms. Uh -huh. So I didn't. And then she's like, do you have any older children? I said, I do. Like, okay, where is he? I'm like, he's at my mom's house. And she's like, is it okay if we stop by to see him? I'm like, he's probably sleeping by now. It's like, oh, we're not going to wake him. We just want to make sure he's okay. And again, I had no idea whatsoever that this was an interrogation, really. Right, right. <laughs> and that they're basically, you know, planning their case, plotting their case against me. And, and up, Rachel, up until this point, the doctors never told you what they thought happened or how the injury happened. So no. you're, you're clueless at this point. You're just, okay. still trying to process everything. Yeah. I'm not sure. Either. Okay. Nothing. So, yeah, so I told him, go ahead. I called my mom, gave him the address. And at that point, the social worker leaves. 
And I'm assuming, you know, 9 p.m., I'm assuming she's going to go from the hospital straight to my mom's house. Fine. So I never see her again. Then the detectives show up along with the police officer that was waiting there for me or that was with me during the interview. So he introduces me to the detectives and they place me in a separate room where there's no windows, right? They close, they ask me to just wait there while we get some stuff sorted out. Is it okay if you wait? Can you wait? And I'm like, sure, of course. So, you know, they leave, they put me in the room, they close the door and they leave me there from about 10 o'clock until one o'clock in the morning waiting. Three hours. Whoa. Yeah. And by that time, my husband arrives from the hospital. I mean, arrives from the, the airport to the hospital and they interview him separately. Right. So now it's all becoming kind of clear what they're doing and interview. Then they come and interview me. They ask me all the questions. They ask me again, what do you think happened? Do you have postpartum? Is it possible you had a seizure? You know, just a bunch of different things about different scenarios that could have happened. What do I know about the nanny? Uh, any nanny cams, any proof? And I said, no. And they, you know, do you think she did this? And at that point, I'm, I no, I don't know. And especially with that in my head that, you know, it's worse than getting shot by a bullet. Like, are you implying that this woman was trying to kill my son? Right. Right. And that, you know, this is, I have to prove beyond a reasonable doubt. Am I going to accuse somebody of doing this when I don't know? So again, they're not saying how it could have been done though, right? Are are you, are you accusing her of what, you know? I mean, you're, how did that happen? Right. Right. So I didn't know. And they mean that I assume they probably had a, they knew, right. What was the diagnosis, but I didn't, I had no idea. Right. No idea whatsoever. So at about 2 a.m. is when I cut them off. I'm like, you know, I've been up since 4 o'clock in the morning. So it's almost 24 hours. And I don't want to have another seizure. I don't want to have a seizure. (laughs) So, you know, please, can I can I go to sleep? I mean, I'll be more than happy to continue tomorrow or whatever. So they were very kind to me. They're like, yes, of course. Okay, we understand. Go, go to bed. So at that point, I see my husband, you know, I walk out, it's two o'clock in the morning. And my husband already knew something at that point, but he didn't tell me because he knew I'd been up, you know, this whole time. He was protecting me, didn't want to stress me out. So he gave me my medication, put the bed. He's like, okay, go to sleep. So the next morning I wake up and he's just staring at me. You know, he has this look on his face. And I first thing I do is look at the bed, you know, see if my baby is there and if he's alive and he is. And I'm like, okay, what happened? He's like, they took David, which is my older son. I mean, what do you mean they took David? Who? Where? How? What? And he's like, social services. The woman who interviewed me showed up with a police officer at two o'clock in the morning at my mom's house. Oh. Yeah, and they knocked on the door at my mom's house and she said to my mom, we're gonna take him. And my mom said, no, you're not. (laughs) And she's like, well, if you don't take him, we're gonna have to arrest you. If you don't give him to us, we're gonna have to arrest you. On what grounds? Right, like failure to cooperate, I don't know. Like, well, now we know, right? But at that point, the police officer is standing right there. Yeah, sure. It's she, very yeah, intimidating. It's very extremely. Intimidating. You're right. And there's cop cars and he's on his radio. We're calling for backup. Yeah. Oh, my God. And the, you know, the social worker, if you don't give him to us, we're going to arrest you. And if we, and my mom's like, if I go to jail, can I take him with me? <laughs> and the social worker, no. No. You're going to get arrested. He's going to go to foster care. And you're not going to be able to care for him because you're going to have a record. Oh, my goodness. Oh, yeah. So a record of trying to protect her, her grandson. Right. And I mean, she, you know, we have all the discovery, all the documents. Like, here's a little visual for you. Oh, my goodness. Oh, oh wow. All the papers. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> wow. For dependency court. <laughs> yeah, oh, my goodness. It's so very daunting. It's, yeah. so, yes. So my mom had, you know, had no choice. Or she thought, you know, we didn't know, had no choice but to give him up. And I mean, she had to strap my son into the social worker's car seat, screaming and crying. And I mean, I can't imagine what, you know, what that scene was. I mean, my mom said she, she urinated all over herself on the sidewalk. 
oh my God. as they were driving off with my son. And at that point, my dad was in the garage calling lawyers, right? Calling friends to refer to a lawyer, like what the heck is going on? I have no idea what's going on. And we probably called about 10 different lawyers and all through referral, 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 because this is a very, very specialized area because basically they don't follow constitutional law. No. They have their own little set of laws. Yes, you can do. call them that. <laughs> yes. So we finally, so that morning, you know, my husband tells me all this and I'm freaking out, of course. Like, where is my son? What do you mean we can't see him? The social worker isn't returning our calls. We have no idea where, where he is. They don't tell us where, he's, where they're taking him. They just straight up take him. And so I'm calling lawyers and my husband is calling the, the social, social workers, the supervisors, what the heck is going on? And that night at 2 a.m., when they took my son to the hospital, or they took my son to the children's shelter, they also took him to the hospital to do medical examinations on my son. And the social worker admits there was no bruises, there was no sign of abuse, the child was healthy, I mean, nothing. Like the grandma's house was clean, he was in a crib, everything was fine, right? But they still removed him, and at the hospital they forced him through a full skeletal survey which I don't know if you've seen how it's done, but basically take a picture of all the individual bones in your body. Oh my <laughs> goodness. While they're taking the images. With, with, with dangerous electromagnetic radiation. Right. Exactly. Radiation wow. On a 20 month old. Oh my gosh. Old. Yeah. And of course he wouldn't lie down still, right? And he's screaming and kicking. And my husband was at the hospital at that point and awake. And he knew that my son was there. He went down to the, to the x-ray room. Oh my goodness. And he explicitly told the people at the hospital, do not do this to my son. You do not have my consent or my permission to perform these exams on my son. And the person, you know, typed in the computer the names and saying, sir, there's a hospital hold on your son. There's a protective order against your children are now in protective custody. Oh my. So you can't... You, you have no say. You can't make demands, yes. Yeah. So my husband is standing outside that room crying, like bawling like a baby, saying, do not do this to my son. And my son had to be tied down to the bed, right, to the medical bed so that they could take all the x-rays of him. They gave him 14 vaccinations. Oh, my gosh. Why? Oh, man, that's criminal right there. I, mean, I don't understand. That's criminal. That because technically he wasn't up to date according to the government standards, right? But we had modified the schedule along with our pediatrician. The okay. pediatrician was with us and he was fine with it. And I mean, 14 at once. I mean, you could have killed my son. Absolutely. Absolutely. It happens every day. Yes. And I'm like, I mean, just crazy. Like the, the, and, and no, interesting, no, no boundaries whatsoever. No, like, that that he was in no regard. Protective, protective custody. Right, exactly. right. Wow. right. And my attorney, every time they said protective custody, they're, he's like, You mean seizure? Yeah. Uh, illegal seizure. That's right. Yeah, yeah. Oh. They had no warrant, no court order, nothing. They had nothing. They didn't even bother to call a judge who would have basically rubber stamped it anyway. That's right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> But they didn't even do that. <laughs> yeah. So my, my husband was there, so he saw them. And then from that point on, they took him to the, the shelter. And they didn't tell us where he was. So I finally get in touch with a lawyer that specializes in this. And he's like, yeah, I can see you this afternoon. So I go to see the lawyer and tell him everything. I'm like, I don't know where my son is. And he's like, oh, I know where he is. Yeah, he's at the shelter. This is what they do, blah, blah, blah. You know, he's really aloof about it. And I'm like, okay, so there must be some kind of mistake, right? Like they can't, how can they do this? And I'm giggling with him because it's so crazy, right? I was laughing about it. And he's looked at me and he's like, you do not understand who you're dealing with. Okay, you are facing 15 years in jail, $100,000 bail. This is a criminal investigation. What happened to your son is criminal. And I'm like, okay, but I didn't do it. And he's like, doesn't matter. This is family court. Doesn't so, matter. You hadn't been arrested. Nobody told you that you were being nope. interrogated. You hadn't gone down to the station to get a statement. 
Nope, nothing. Well, at, so at this point, have they still said why they think that this happened? Where the, the brain? Yeah, well, at that point, I didn't know anything, but the, what they called the child abuse expert on staff right. at the hospital. Yeah. Now they don't identify themselves as such. She just introduced herself as the pediatrician on call. Oh, wow. Right. For the PICU. Right? So I'm talking to a doctor, right? And she's asking me, you know, so what happened? How did this occur? And I said, I don't know. He was with the nanny. So again, I go over this, the whole story again. And she's like, okay. And then my husband, you know, he's trying to understand what happened as well. So he's like, I would see the nanny at night sometimes, you know, when he had to get up in the middle of the night to go to the restroom or go to the kitchen or something. And he said, I'd see the nanny sitting on a futon holding the baby, right, on the futon. Is it possible that if she fell asleep and dropped the baby, could this kind of injury have occurred. And the doctor's like, no, not possible. Dropping a baby? Yeah. So did they ever ask for her name at they all? Or? Yeah, I gave them all the information. And after I got a lawyer and a private investigator, I found out that her husband is a cop. Oh, oh. my gosh. Wow, okay. Her husband, yeah. So she told me he was in the Marines, which is true but he was also in the police academy. She never mentioned that to me. Okay. So the detectives that night, they did put her name in the system and they saw that she was related to law enforcement. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. Wow. So make of that what you will. <laughs> right. And so, you know, further, we had the hearing. This happened from Wednesday to Thursday. I met the lawyer on Friday. We had our court hearing scheduled for Monday, wow. right? So at, on Monday is the first time I was ever going to see all these documents, what the doctor had said, what the detective had said, what the, I, that's the first time I was going to see anything. Okay. In the meantime, your infant is still in the hospital. Right? Still in the okay. hospital. Okay. Still in the medically induced coma. No pressure there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And then I couldn't see my other son, right? Like they wouldn't, he was in the shelter. I'm like, what? Oh my gosh, yeah, that was one of the worst days of my life because after I saw the lawyer on Friday, he told me, he's like, you're not getting your kids back. And I'm like, what do you mean I'm not getting my kids back? They, I didn't do this. Right. And he's like, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. The, the judge only has to believe 51% of what social services tells them. And if he believes 51% of what he told them, then he doesn't even have to listen to your side of the story. Oh my gosh. And I'm like, but that's crazy. I'm like, what country are we in? What happened to the Constitution? Yeah. What happened to innocent until proven guilty? He's like, nope, not in family court. So he's like, so I'm not even going to fight for you. I'm not even going to bother asking the judge to give the kids back to you because they're not getting your kids back. If you fight to get your kids back, you're probably going to go to foster care. And they can be legally adopted if they're under two years old by the foster family if the case lasts longer than six months. Hey, so this is your attorney. This is my attorney. Oh, wow. That's great. <laughs> yeah. He's telling me, he's like, they will make it last longer than six months. Just so that they can adopt the kids out. And he's so, supposed so, to be so, the specialized no, lawyer. So this, yeah, no, but he's being open with me. He's telling me, like, this is what's going yeah. on. This is your attorney oh. that knows the system. Exactly. Is corrupt. Yeah. Yeah, no, he's <laughs> telling me. He's like, this is what's going to happen. I just want everybody to understand what you just said, that your attorney knows the yeah. system is corrupt and he's yeah. warning you. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So right. He's warning me and he's telling me, you do exactly what they say. Okay. okay you, now is not the time to fight. Now is not the time to fight. Because if you piss them off, you know, right. I mean, yeah, don't, don't do it. You be quiet. I mean, he, he was scared the heck out of me. Like, really, I mean, and he's this big, burly Italian guy. I mean, look like the Godfather. Right? <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. So <laughs> he would scare me. I mean, he made me cry every week. My husband to this day can't stand it. <laughs> oh. <laughs> oh. <laughs> so, but I'm like, but he was right. I mean, he was right. He knew their game. He knew what they were going to do. And he right. told me, he's like, you do not talk to the detective anymore. You do not talk to the law enforcement anymore. You don't talk to anybody. I'm pleading the fifth on your behalf. And that's it. You don't talk to them. Don't fall for their psychological games. Yeah. They're going to try to pressure you. They're going to tell you if you're a good mother, you'll cooperate with them. Don't listen to them. You do not talk to them. 
Okay, and so at, at this point, you haven't been charged, though, with anything, no, right? No, okay. no charge, but they opened the criminal investigation. So they opened the criminal. A, yes. So he was an attorney just what, so you, at this point, you don't have a, a defense attorney. Okay. No, not a criminal defense attorney. <clears throat> okay, all right. Yeah, so he was just specialized in family court. And so your says, world was turned upside yeah, down right. in about 72 hours. Crazy. You were like. Totally. I'm like, what the heck is going on? They're like, this is impossible. I'm like, what country am I living in? Right. Ooh, crazy. crazy. And he's like, listen, nobody here is your friend. Nobody. Not the social workers, not the judge, not the police. Nobody is your friend. The only person here who's your friend is me, and that's only because you paid me. <laughs> he was telling it like it was. Yes, he was. Yeah, unfortunately, <laughs> that's the wor- that's the way the world has become, you know? Yeah. That's yeah. what I'm saying right now. Wow. So, I mean, you know, he was straight up, but I'm, I'm grateful. I mean, he opened my eyes. He wasn't playing with me. He told yeah. me yeah. straight up. And then the private investigator who I hired, you know, he's been working with him forever with this attorney. And, you know, anytime he'd make me cry, I'd call the, the private investigator. <laughs> <laughs> For some support. <laughs> and the private investigator is like Santa Claus, right? He's in his 70s. <laughs> And he went to Pepperdine University, the same university I went to. <laughs> yeah, so that was your support, right? Right. So I would call him and he's like, okay, look, listen, the same way he talks to you, imagine him tenfold in the courtroom. Okay. 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 That's how he is. The way he, he talks to you, that's the way he fights for you when he's okay. in court. Right. So the only positive thing so far. Right. So he's a bully, but he's a bully in court as well. Okay. Okay. For your family and for your children. Okay. So then he's like, if you need to ask something, you know, call me, I'll ask him and I'll tell you. Don't <laughs> call me. He was your middleman. Right. Right. He was. <laughs> okay. The cushion a little bit. <laughs> I'm glad you can laugh a little bit about this. Yes, oh my gosh. Of course. Now I have to, I mean, yeah, yeah. you know, now Either we have laugh. a happy ending, but during that time, so his strategy, my lawyer's strategy. And again, I had to hire two separate attorneys, one for my husband, one yep. for me. Is that how ridiculous is that? Uh, yeah, that is crazy. And, and I won't, I won't, uh, I won't break the, the surprise to everybody about the two attorneys. You can yeah. tell. <laughs> so his strategy, basically, he's like, okay, your saving grace is that your husband was out of town when this happened. So legally speaking, his hands are clean. He wasn't even present at the crime scene. He has nothing, absolutely nothing. Right. So we're going to ask the judge to give sole custody to your husband. And they are probably going to kick you out of the house. Oh, my God. So I said, okay. And I'm, do I get to see my kids? Like, I don't know. That's all going to be decided at the hearing. Yep. But listen, if you don't want your kids in foster care, this is your best bet. Sure. And at that point, I'm like, okay, of course, whatever I have to do to keep my kids out of foster care. And at least they're with my husband. And you're fine. Like, it's a piece of paper saying he has custody. But yeah. <laughs> yeah. So that's what we did. And it's like, okay, so you're... Husband will have to get his own counsel. I'm like, do you know anybody? Like, yeah. His brother, his twin brother. Twin brother. brother. <laughs> twin brother. <laughs> awesome. They're twin brothers. Together. Yeah, I love it. I was cracking up when I read that. Twin today. brother. <laughs> yeah. Yes, one time at, during our court hearings, I saw the brother walking down, and I go hug the brother, and he's like, no, it's not me. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Man. So we have the two brothers <laughs> representing us. <laughs> My yeah. goodness. They, these guys, this is so funny. <laughs> I wish I could see pictures of that. That would be the greatest. This I know. I'm so like, this is a Lifetime movie, right? This could totally be yes. a movie. <laughs> oh, it's a Lifetime Definitely. movie. Definitely. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> as long as it's got a happy ending, and yeah. it does. Yeah, so. yeah. yeah. All it does. Right. So, you know, finally at the hearing, we arrive on Monday night. Okay, so on, on Friday, then he calls. He tells me where my son is. He gets in touch with the social worker. He gets in touch with the lawyers, the children's lawyers. And he gets us a visit with our son, with our 20-month-old son who was at the shelter. And they gave us 30 minutes with our son. So I arrive at the shelter. You know, it's clean, a bunch of cribs all lined up, and a little playroom and rocking chairs. And, you know, the lady who was there with him, you know, he looks at me, I smile, you know, I give him, like, I open my arms and like no reaction from him. He's like a zombie, Mm. complete zombie. He was on drugs. No, he was, I don't know if he was on drugs or if he was just, he was traumatized, completely traumatized. Had to be. Totally traumatized, you know, and the woman is talking to me, yeah, he didn't sleep well last night. And I'm like, oh, duh, 
Well, and, 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 <laughs> well, he had how many vaccines 14, as well? Right. And, and taken at two o'clock in the morning to a complete stranger. Yeah. yeah. And so, and she's like, yeah, he hasn't eaten. I'm like, yeah, you know, like, again, duh. <laughs> exactly. So, you know, I, I sit on the floor with him. I start playing with him. And, you know, slowly he starts letting his guard down and starts playing with us and my husband. And, I mean, we're here, you know, under a microscope, cameras everywhere. The social worker's student's sitting right there. Yeah. And, you know, I got to hold him and hug him. And finally, you know, when he was sort of back, getting back to normal, they're like, your time is up. So I'm going to have to ask you to leave now. And I get up, you know, my son is, of course, running after me, coming after me. And I'm like, I'm sorry, mommy, mommy, and daddy have to go. And I hug him and he's screaming as I'm leaving, you know, holding onto my leg, not letting go of my leg. The social worker, you know, has to pry him off. And me and my husband never cried so much in our lives. I mean, you know, like two babies ourselves, yeah. you know, holding each other's hands and walking to the parking lot. You know, we didn't look back, but we could just hear him screaming for mommy and daddy. And I'm like, this is, you know, how can these people think that this is good for a child? <laughs> yeah. And that this is in the best interest of the child, which is their MO? Yeah. No. And I mean, it was, I, God, it was God. It seriously was God. I don't know how I didn't lose my mind, how I didn't go crazy. Yeah. And, you know, we went home. Of course, we cried. We prayed. We told everybody what was going on for the hearing on Monday. And they released him to my mom. Thankfully, they released him to my mom yeah. on Saturday afternoon because my mom was a public school teacher and her fingerprints were already in the system. You know, she already had clearance, basically, right. to wow. be a foster parent if she wanted to. Yeah. So the social worker went to her house, did the assessment of her house, passed, you know, the assessment for her house. And then they asked my mom, would you be willing to adopt your, your grandsons? And my mom was like, no. <laughs> and she's like, no, I mean, we don't know what's going to happen on Monday, right? We don't know what's going to happen at the hearing. And my mom's like, give them back to their mom, to who they rightfully belong. And the social worker is like, well, you know, if the judge orders the removal of the children, we would rather they go to family. My mom's like, okay. And the social worker is like, you'll get $670 a month per child. You will qualify for the food stamps. You qualify for WIC, which is here in California. Yeah. yeah. And all these social programs. And my mom is like, I don't want your money. Right. And the okay. social worker said, no, but, you know, this is to help you out. And my mom is like, can I save it for the lawyer? <laughs> yeah, right. And the social worker, okay, I'll pretend I didn't hear that. <laughs> oh, my goodness. So, but, you know, they basically, not forced my mom, but, I mean, they gave, you know, the idea that my children were going to be taken away. And if right. you don't adopt them, then somebody else will. Right. Oh, my God. So my mom's like, okay, fine. So they signed the papers. So this is before there was ever a hearing in front of a judge, before there was ever an investigation, I mean, before anything. Like you said, 72 hours later, they had already made up their minds that I somehow did this to my son and that my older son was in danger, right? Because I was apparently an abusive parent. <laughs> so my mom signed the papers. And they released him to her. So he spent the weekend with my mom. And then on Monday, when we had the hearing, again, he comes to the hearing with my mom. And when I see him, he runs away from me. Yeah. yeah he I turns remember. around and runs away from me and like grabs my mom's leg. And, you know, I get down on my knees to the floor on his level. I'm like, David, it's mommy. And he's just looking at me like, you know, in my heart, just broke into a million pieces at that point. And, you know, logically, of course, I can understand, you know, he, he felt abandoned. You know, I, I abandoned him first, two o'clock in the morning, these people take me. Then two days later, my grandma picks me up. And, you know, where the heck are you? Right. right? And I, you know, again, my lawyer's like, you can't say anything. You can't talk to anybody, not to your children, not to nobody. So all I could do you know, I, yeah, you know, take the, the pain for my son. You know, I had to, I had to take it. 
And we went into the courtroom that day. My husband and his attorney on one side, me and my attorney on the other side, children's lawyers over there, social services lawyers over there, judge over here. And we're there and I'm still like, this is twilight zone. Like I can't believe I'm literally sitting here. Yeah. I'm gonna lose my kids, right? I'm like, this is not happening. This is not happening. <laughs> So my lawyer, you know, while they're legally speak, I don't even remember what he said, but basically asking the judge to give custody to my husband and that his counsel is in agreement, the father is in agreement, and then he'll ask the children's lawyers, do you agree? Yes. Then they ask social services, do you agree? No. We object. Do you object? Yes, we object. And the judge, why do you object? Because we never got to speak to the father. We never interviewed the father. Yes. So we don't know if he is a viable option either. We don't know if he's a safe person for the, the children to go with. Crazy. Now, interestingly enough, at the hospital, the initial interview we had, uh, law enforcement told social services to not interview my husband. So, yeah, that was right. That's crazy. I was like, yeah. that's unbelievable. Right? Yeah. Wow. So I... So I think in their heads, like due to the nature of the investigation, because now it was a criminal investigation, right. I guess law enforcement takes over as opposed to social services. It should be that way in a criminal right. investigation. So they told social worker, do not interview the father or the nanny. Yeah. 